will bury you. And you will never see it coming. Those are the words of Anthony Raitt, the man who framed John. The prosecution put on a house of cards, card after card after card after card. But we saw how flimsy each card was. And in a court of law, when people's lives are at stake, a house of cards must fall. Number one, all of the evidence points to the fact that John was buried by his father-in-law, Anthony Ray. As many of us in this room are, Parents want what is best for their children. We'll do anything for them. And all we really want for our children is to be loved, to be safe, to be happy and healthy. And unfortunately, Bonnie had none of those things. So when Anthony Ray came home and opened that door, and he saw that John was cheating on his daughter. He told him, and you're gonna have to excuse my language. You have fucked with my daughter the last time. I will bury you and you will never see it coming. And he buried him. I would like to direct your attention to three things that help really illustrate this. One, all of the evidence, all of it, points to the fact that John was buried. One, he was driving someone else's car. And that car was parked at Anthony Raitt's house. Who knew that John was going to borrow that car that day because John's car was not working. And just as you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure had to find alternate modes of transportation when we had a strike, a SEPTA strike last month, John that day had to find an alternate mode of transportation. So he did what many of us in this room probably did or would do, and that's borrow your spouse's car. Now let's talk about that anonymous tip. An anonymous tip. Shortly after John left, someone put in this anonymous tip and said, there is a car, describe the make and model, that has a gun. Let me point out, it's a police model caliber. And Anthony Ray used to be a police officer. And it has controlled substances. Controlled substances? Who talks that way? What regular person talks that way? If you're thinking a drug dealer or a druggie called the police and said, there's controlled substances and guns in that car. Our common, sense tell, our common sense tells us that that didn't happen that way. Our common sense tells us that someone who called in controlled substances is someone who's in law enforcement, Anthony Ray, because he himself placed those items there, a police model revolver and controlled substances. Our common sense also tells us that Anthony Ray just isn't seeing the bigger picture here. Because John was picking the pieces back up. He made a mistake. He cheated on his wife. But 
he had an excellent job to help provide for the family. A computer programmer makes an average $80,000 a year. That's an excellent job for a 28-year-old to have. He has two children, John Jr., Lindsay, his wife, they were patching things up. But Anthony Rate just saw revenge, and he buried him. He hated him, and he fulfilled his promise that he would bury him. Let's turn to that second point. All of the evidence supports what John is telling us, and none of the evidence contradicts it. There is no DNA. None of any kind. There is no physical evidence that tells you that John had possession of that gun and that John had possession of controlled substances with intent to distribute. He was simply driving through Philadelphia that morning on his way to work. He didn't know those things were there. Because I know that when I get in the car, my husband's car nonetheless, I'm not going to search it. Little did it, he know that Anthony Rate had placed a police revolver in the passenger seat and drugs in the middle slid in between the chair and the middle console. He's simply again driving to get to work because he had to be at work at 5 a.m. folks. I don't know about you, but how is someone going to get to work at 5 a.m. but at 3.30 they're in Philadelphia selling drugs? It just doesn't make sense. And our common sense tells us that. Which leads me to the third point. Unfortunately, our police officers did a sloppy job on this one. There's no DNA, no fingerprints, nothing pulled. I know Anthony Rate set this up in a way where he knew, because he saw that John was leaving that morning, he could easily see it out the window, and he knew John was going to take that car that day because he knew John's car was broken down, so he set it up in a certain way. But when John told the police, when he cooperated that very same day and told them exactly what he's telling you here, this is not my stuff, this is not my car, and Bonnie, my wife, her friends do drugs. When all of those things are being told to the police, your antenna should go up. Something may not be right here, let me check. Because when someone's life is at stake, the least they can do is just check, just pull a DNA a fingerprint. I know the police said that it would be, they didn't want to incur extra costs, but we shouldn't send an innocent person to jail because they didn't want to incur extra costs. Instead, we should be sure that we are sending guilty people away but not innocent ones. Something else too, if they really believed that this um, was an intent to distribute case, their antennas should have also gone up when the baggies turned out to be eight to 11 grams of cocaine and not the usual three and a half grams that are used for distribution. I don't know, you know, if someone were to try and sell drugs higher than the normal amount, I don't understand how the customers who are just people in the street would know that this is more and this they need to pay more. It's just very complicated. It doesn't jive. So what I would have done and what you would have done is just check a simple fingerprint. But they didn't do that. And that was careless. Now the prosecution tried to say that, well, what was John doing in this part of the city? 3.30 in the morning. John told us he was going to work. He had to be at work at 5. He wasn't stopped in the middle of this part of the city. 
He wasn't caught selling drugs there. He wasn't even, he was just simply driving through. It's not a crime to drive through the city. Many of you folks know here that you take your chances any way, any route you take in, in the city, whether it's 95, whether it's 76, whether it's the local streets. I don't know about you folks, but I usually bet on the local streets. And that's what John did that day. So don't let them distract you with their house of cards. Now, you're shortly going to get a verdict sheet. And that verdict sheet is going to ask you two questions. Did the prosecution prove without a reasonable doubt that John possessed controlled substances with the intent to distribute? Intent to distribute controlled substances and possessed. It all goes back to possessed and reasonable doubt. So let me explain those two things. How could John possess something if he doesn't know what's there? And all the evidence shows you that. Why would John possess a police model revolver? Why would John possess drugs? He has an $80,000 job, $80,000 a year job. Why would he need to sell drugs for a couple of hundred bucks? Doesn't make and whether he possessed a firearm. Again, how can you possess something when you don't know it's there? It's not your car. You're simply driving to work. And now let me quickly explain reasonable doubt because sometimes people place it a higher burden, a lower burden, so let me quickly explain. Imagine there's a box and I put a cat and a mouse in it, and I seal that box tightly and well. I leave for 30 minutes, come back, I open it up, and the mouse is gone, but that cat is there. Reasonable doubt told me, or lack of reasonable doubt, excuse me, told me that this cat ate the mouse. But if I do this whole scenario again, and when I open that box, and I take that lid off, and I look inside, I see a hole in that corner of the box. Folks, that's reasonable doubt. And the prosecution's house of cards just simply has too many holes. Hole one, the police revolver. Hole two, the anonymous convenient tip. Hole three, this is someone else's car. Hole four, John has told them from the very beginning what happened. Hole five, there is no eyewitness that connects John to possessing or knowing about these items in the car, much less intend to distribute them. Hole five, no DNA. Hole six, no prints. And hole seven, the most important, the very threat that this would happen. I will bury you and you will never see it coming. Ladies and gentlemen, let Anthony Rate know that you saw him coming and find John not guilty. Thank you.